Well, good afternoon. It's uh, 1.30 in the Eastern Coast. Um, and so we'll start it with this uh, session. It is my uh, great pleasure to introduce today uh, Thomas Philippon, who is the Max L. Heine Professor of Finance at NYU, uh, at, at NYU uh, Stern School of Business. Uh, Thomas has studied various topics in microeconomics and finance, uh, such as systemic risk, crisis resolution mechanisms, the dynamics of corporate investment and household debt, and the size of the finance industry. Uh, with recent work that has focused on the Eurozone crisis financial regulation, and more recently in the topic of today's talk, the market power of uh, large firms. Uh, so today, uh, precisely, Thomas will be presenting his paper on dominant firms in the economy. Uh, Thomas, you will have uh, 45 minutes to an hour for your presentation and we'll run that straight. And then afterwards, uh, we will be uh, holding a discussion. So to the audience, please do share your questions in the Q&A uh, and I'll uh, gather them and then transmit them uh, to Thomas. Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to join you for this conference. Um, in terms of timing, I, I think I'm planning to talk for about 45 minutes. So we will have plenty of times for Q&A. And so this is based on uh, joint work with various co-authors, but uh, mainly uh, Herman Gutierrez. And uh, I thought the title for this talk should be Dominant Firms in the Economy, because that's the common thread uh, of what I'm going to talk about. So we know that large firms have played a very important role in the economy, at least since uh, the 19th century, with the uh, you know, uh, development of large-scale uh, manufacturing. And uh, the debate about the role of large firms has become, um, once again, quite hot, because there is more discussion today of whether the biggest firms are too big, too dominant, whether they have too much market power and whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. So what I'm gonna to try to uh, discuss today is, well, first of all, whether it is indeed true that large firms are becoming relatively more important today than in the past, uh, maybe not in all industries, maybe in some industries. We'll see that the data is mixed on that. It depends on where you go. It depends what your metric is. Um, and uh, it's not necessarily the case in all industries. But the most important, though, is to understand why we observe these dynamics. And um, if we understand why, then maybe we have a chance of being able to say whether overall this is a good development or not. So one classic motivation is um, the concentration of sales at the industry level in the US. So this shows the evolution of the CR8, so that's the, <clears throat> the share of total industry output that comes from the top eight firms uh, in each industry. Now industry here, the one issue is they are not always defined at the level of granularity, which is fine enough for our tastes. Um, so in manufacturing it tends to be quite precise, outside manufacturing it's a bit broader. But you can see that, um, so if you take uh, you know, the non-manufacturing sector, we've added roughly eight points to CR8 since the 1990s. And much of the growth happens you know, somewhere in the early 2000s. Um, for manufacturing, we see roughly the same pattern, but the, the increase is, uh, is smaller. Now, the baseline concentration is Depends a lot on the sector, obviously, but it's a number like between say 0 0.2 or 0 0.3. So if you think of it that way, roughly speaking, concentration has gone up by about a quarter. Okay, so which means if you had uh, like an industry with five, uh, five or four firms that were uh, dominant, now you will be down to three or four firms that are dominant. Okay, so that's the extent of the change. So it's very significant. Uh, it's not infinitely large. Okay, so there is a debate just about 
uh, the fact, of course, because the main issue here is whether the definition of the industry is precise enough, and it could it could be uh, it could lack precision in two dimensions. One is just the definition of the industry, which is too broad. Um, so you would like to have a more narrowly defined industry. And the other one is the geography, of course, because some industries, although not the most important one, but some industries have a local component. So if you think about retail, uh, at least uh, part of retail um, is local in the sense that uh, some of the hardware stores or some of the food store that you might use uh, you know, you care about how many you have in your neighborhood. And then the question is, if big chains expand, then you know, maybe you could have a national level rise in concentration that would not imply that there is more concentration at the local level. Um, it's potentially there. I think it's much more of an issue in Europe. Uh, in the US, you can see a little bit of it, but all the cases that we really care about, they're all nationals anyway. So I don't think that one is actually such a big deal. Um, but the, def the proper definition of an industry is a big deal, okay? So you have to always take these things with a grain of salt. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on the debate about the data. I'm gonna spend much of my time on the debate about the economics of it, which is assuming that indeed there's some rise in concentration, however uh, we can measure it. That just doesn't answer any interesting economic question because we don't know whether it's a good sign or a bad sign, okay? so to to make the long story short, uh, you could have good or bad concentration. Good concentration um, happens when you have an industry where you already have uh, market leaders and these market leaders just happen to be more innovative than their followers. So mechanically then they are gonna you know, run ahead even more. So their market share is gonna increase. Um, because they were already dominant, that means concentration is gonna go up. Any measure of concentration is gonna increase in that case. But that would be good news because it would be concentration driven by innovation by the leader. And typically they would come together with lower prices, higher productivity. Uh, in recent years, almost every example you can think of is gonna be tightly linked to intangible investment. Um, and we see example of that in the US in the retail trade or wholesale trade sectors. Okay, so that's kind of the good concentration. The bad concentration is when the market share of the leader uh, or leaders uh, increases because they successfully kick out competitors. They prevent competition. Um, and that way they can get away with higher prices. Uh, then we don't see the higher productivity. In fact, some oftentimes we see lower productivity. And a good example of that in the US would be telecoms, airlines, and health, healthcare. So the debate is whether um, on balance, we have more of the good or the bad concentration and what we can do about it. So to be more precise, here's one example of what good concentration looks, looks like. Um, it's the expansion of Walmart in the 1990s. So on the right, you have the market share of Walmart from zero to 60%. Um, so of course, this is unprecedented by scale, right? This is 60%, so it's a huge market share. Um, and the growth happens, you know, mostly in the 1990s. It happens because Walmart innovates in uh, supply chain management and just-in-time inventory management. In um, Also, a lot of it is innovation in the way it interacts with the suppliers. So a lot of the innovation is IT related. And what you can see is that this type of innovation comes together with flat or, if anything, slightly declining profit margins. Okay, so the dramatic expansion of Walmart uh, did not come together with higher profit margins for Walmart. In fact, if anything, you see at the time of the large expansion, the margin were falling a little bit. Um, some of it is a composition effect. They just shifted to goods with lower margins. Um, but at least you can say they didn't increase their profit margin. So what that means mechanically then is that every percentage point of TFP growth that Walmart achieved was translated as a 1% lower price for consumers. Okay. So when we see that as economists, we like it. And it's important to keep in mind that a good concentration does not mean that it's not controversial. There's tons of controversies about Walmart, about, about mostly about labor practices, but even 
even in purely uh, competitive terms, like, you know, maybe it's a bad idea to put too many uh, small stores out of business. Maybe it's bad for the communities, okay? So even in that case, you can still have a, an interesting debate about policy. But at the very least, you can say it's a good deal for consumers, okay? So that's my bar. My bar is not to say that there's no controversy. My bar for good consumption is consumers get a good deal. Um, the, only, the other thing I really like about the Walmart example is how it, how it ends, because it ends precisely the way you like capitalism to work, which is by the time. So you can see, like in Walmart, achieves its peak around you know maybe 2005, and uh, it's it's you know getting close to 60% market share. Of course, at the time, if you read the news report, there is talk about doing an antitrust investigation of Walmart because it's becoming too dominant, but since the market is working properly, by the time you start to really worry about their market share, the market gives you the solution, which is uh, called Amazon, which starts to compete with Walmart at the time where you worry Walmart would be too uh, dominant. And so innovation and entry by a new competitor starts to erode the market share of Walmart. So you don't actually need to worry too much about antitrust because the market solves it for you. Okay, so that's kind of the, that's the base case scenario for the Chicago school approach. Uh, free entry, uh, make sure that when the firm becomes dominant, it doesn't become too dominant. Um, it also makes the case, by the way, for people who complain about industry classification, because this market share is defined with SIC codes and Amazon is not in the same SIC codes as Walmart. So you wouldn't, according to this metric, you would not even see the entry of Amazon. Okay. So I think that's kind of the poster child for good uh, concentration. Um, and if you link it to macro, uh, fully one third of the total productivity gains in the 90s uh, in the US came from retail trade. So it's a huge deal. Okay. So the question is, is it what we see today? And I think what you see today, unfortunately, is not that. So the polar opposite of Walmart is the telecom industry in the US, um, which was quite good in the 1990s and early 2000 and became a complete disaster afterwards. So um, you see the rising concentration and rising markups. So exactly the opposite of what we saw with Walmart, right? The concentration here comes together with higher and higher profit margins. Uh, and these are large increases to the point that today, uh, um, by a huge margin, the US, invest, US household get the worst deal uh, in the world when they have to buy communication services. They pay much more for their broadband and for their cell phones uh, no, I don't mean the cell phone, cell phone plans, not the actual toy. The toy is the same price everywhere because that's a tradable good. But the cell phone plans are way more expensive than in any other country uh, in the world, okay? Um, and it's not again by five or 10%, it's people here pay double what people pay in Europe or Japan or Korea, okay? Um, and it's, it's completely new. The US used to have a relatively cheap communication services. If you do the same comparison in the 1990s, like like I do in my book, uh, you find that at that time, the US has very competitive communication markets and people in the US pay less than people in Europe for access to internet, okay? So complete reversal over 20 years, entirely driven by concentration and market power by the big telecom firms. So that's bad concentration. But of course, that doesn't tell you, okay, on average, what do we see? More of one, more of the other. <clears throat> That's very controversial. Uh, there's no obvious way you can uh, do it short of a full model, which I'll discuss later. As a first pass, you can do something purely empirical just to figure out in the data, do we see more of a cluster of concentration that come, that is correlated with um, intangible investment, high productivity, low prices? Or do we see more of a cluster of concentration with low intangible investment, low productivity growth and higher prices. And um, so it's like a principal component. The one thing that's interesting, which is not obvious ex ante, is that um, the, this good versus bad concentration dichotomy, even though it is simplistic, it actually is not too bad as a description of the data in the sense that the PC1, PC2 uh, component do line up pretty well. So the data wants to say, well, sometimes we see concentration, but it comes together with TFP and intangible investment. And sometimes we see the opposite. And these two things together, that's a lot of the variance. Okay, so there's something to it. Um, and so what you can see here is that the prevalence of uh, PC1, which is 
which I guess we would call good concentration, is relatively flat over time. So it's not disappearing. We still see these dynamics in industries in the US. But uh, the thing that's striking is the other one, the one that looks like bad concentration, used to be very rare, not very prevalent in the 1990s, but then become much more prevalent in the 2000s. Okay. So that's the hint that perhaps we see more of the bad type today than we used to. Um, if you want to make more progress, then uh, you really need to think about other variation in the data, some kind of control group. Uh, and in particular, if you want to understand whether some of it might reflect uh, technological changes versus policy changes, you need to have a, a comparison to a, a place where you could argue technology is similar, but policy is different. And that's where I started looking at Europe. So what's interesting in Europe is that over the same period of time, um, it went to a large extent the other way, which is uh, it started from markets that were relatively heavily regulated with lots of uh, state monopolies. Um, and it started uh, slowly but surely to remove barriers to entry uh, in various sectors. And so uh, in the data, they typically they are called product market reforms. And this is counting the number of reforms per country per year. And you can see that from the mid 90s to the mid 2000s, there was on average like one, you know, major reform per country per year, or one important reform per country per year. So it's not huge if you think of the number of industries, but it's significant over time. So as a result of that, uh, we see many prices in Europe going down relative to the US and continuing on the telecom industry, uh, you see striking changes. So this is the price of communication in France relative to the US. So literally this is, uh, all you have to do to get that, you just get data from the, the World Bank data on PPP comparison across countries, so the one we use for uh, comparing the standards of living around the world. So they collect prices and they have one price item for communication. You divide the US, France by the US, you put some uh, exchange rate adjustment, but actually the exchange rate doesn't really do anything here. So whether you do it uh, with or without doesn't matter. Uh, and you see that France used to be say 15% more expensive and uh, something happened in 2011. And then by 2014 it's 25% cheaper. If you continue the graph today, it's 60%. So 40% cheaper. What happened in 2011? Well, we moved from four to three, sorry, from three to four. We had an oligopoly of three telecom um, players, three uh, uh, incumbents, all with legacy assets. They all came from history. One was a old state monopoly and the other ones were also linked to that. And, you know, as a nice oligopoly, they all had the same price and uh, which was high and they all have high profit margins. But that to enter that market, you need a license and you need bandwidth. And you need to have a, um, a little bit of a leg up to enter because nobody's going to buy um, a cell phone plan without coverage, but nobody can build coverage before they have consumers. So that's the catch 22, right? So how do you do that? Well, regulator can decide that incumbents who don't use some bandwidth, uh, if they don't use it, they need to rent it out to uh, the new player. Of course, at some premium, so at cost plus some margin. Um, and then that new player then has a license with bandwidth and, and maybe one or two years to start building their own network. And that's what they did in 2011. Um, the player was free, free mobile. And uh, in fact, free mobile had been asking for a license for many years before. And under heavy uh, lobbying by the three uh, oligopolist incumbents, they got denied for many years. Finally, in 2011, uh, the right decision was made, uh, free entered, and within six months slashed the price by 50%. So it's not a marginal change. Literally, the same contract that was offered at 40 euros per month by the incumbents was offered at 20 euros per month by the new player. So they start to gain market share, and uh, six months later, the incumbents, all of them, start to slash their prices and eventually also go down to 20 euros. So in equilibrium, what you see is that the market share of free went from zero to maybe 12 or something. But it's not like a massive, massive, massive change in market shares. It's a massive change in prices okay? because of course the incumbent reacted. So that's one example of one product market reform in one country in Europe. OK, 
Okay, and this is you know, the number of them over the years. So um, if you then broaden the, the spectrum, you can keep track of the level of regulation. I mean, one way to do it is to look at the OECD PMR indexes. So they add up, it's an index from one to four, I guess from zero to four, um, and uh, they add up restrictions to entry, broadly speaking. And what you can see is the, and these are these data are by vintages of release, but the release of course is based on data a bit earlier. So the 1998 release was based on data collected in like 96, 97. So you see roughly in the mid nineties, um, Europe has more regulation to entry than the US, which is a red line. But then year by year, there is a convergence. And if you look at the, well, we're going to have a new vintage soon, but at the one from the early 2010s, you can see that most of Europe is close to the US. In fact, a significant fraction has fewer buyers to entry now than the US itself. Over that period, the US is kind of flattish. So um, I think that's part of the dynamics in Europe. And that's important when you interpret the data. So this is the raw data from the OECD. Um, on changes, oh, the units are messed up, sorry, on the left. Um, so this is a 5% and 10 percentage point here. So tech uh, non-financial services. So roughly speaking, concentration in non-financial services in Europe has gone up by about four points and by about 10 points in the US. So clearly more in the US, but even that I think could be misleading because in Europe we have some uh, cross-border consolidation, which um, is actually pro-competitive. And that's that, if you think about Europe, that's the one case where um, it does matter the geography. Because if you think about the creation of pan-European groups, then you could measure at the EU level, or even at some country level, uh, an increase in concentration. But that would be in fact linked to higher, not lower competition. So what's interesting at the end of the day, if you compare the US and Europe is that um, the evolution was different and it was at least in large part uh, driven by policy differences, okay? So when you see prices going down in Europe and up in the US, it's not because of total technological differences, it's because of uh, changes in policy. Um, so one way to look at it is to look at the markup over time so this is normalized to uh, zero in 2001. And that's the evolution of the price cost margin in the EU and in the US. Okay. This one is using just uh, the marginal cost is just measured as uh, um, productivity adjusted wages, okay, unit cost, unit labor cost. And you can see that in Europe, well, depending on how you look at it, it's either slightly declining or flat, definitely not increasing. Where in the US, there's a sharp increase in price cost margin, which of course you can see also in aggregate profit trends, which are much higher in the US than in, than in Europe. And a good chunk of these correspond to changes in, in policy. Um, the one thing I should emphasize here is the, for this comparison, the one sector that you cannot unfortunately use is the high tech industry, the internet platforms, because there is no comparison group. Like if, I, if you compare the telecom, then you can literally compare a cell phone plan offered by um, AT&T in the US and free mobile in France. If you could look at the price of a plane ticket, you can do the same. Um, it goes for pretty much every services. But if you want to compare the impact of say uh, Apple or Google, well, there is no counterpart in Europe. So did con this comparison here, does not help you understand anything about internet platforms, unfortunately. Okay, so that's a big caveat. It works for the rest, for the old economy to some extent. Uh, but the thing is the old economy is still a big chunk of what people spend their money on. So if you want to put some numbers, what I do here is <clears throat> either I can use the EU as the benchmark or I can use the US itself. And you can see it doesn't change much because the EU is, EU is kind of flat. So whether you compare the US to itself in, in 2000 or to where you benchmark by what happens in Europe, um, I always end up with an estimate of prices for CPI, uh, excluding housing. Housing is, a, is complicated, so, and healthcare. Okay. 
Um, so the, the basket of, of non-housing, non-healthcare, mostly non-healthcare, um, prices paid by US consumers. Um, if you look at that, my estimate is it's about 7% too high. 7% too high in the sense that this 7% compare, co correspond to uh, monopoly profits earned by the firms. So in terms of numbers, that's about $300 per household per month. Um, if you do nationwide for, uh, for 12 months, that's about 600 billion that household pay directly each year in monopoly profits to firms. Um, and if you, sim if you just use a simple uh, DSG model to simulate what would happen if we could uh, dial back to have uh, competitive industries in the US, then GDP would, uh, ex private GDP would expand by about $1 trillion. Um, and on top of it, you would have 250 billion of redistribution because as you shrink profit margins, you tend to, well, two things happen. You, demand, ex I mean, GDP expands, so that's good for everyone, but the margins fall. So uh, total profit could go up or down depending on the assumption, but in, for reasonable parameters, profits go down actually. So uh, in other words, the, the margin effect dominates and profits would go down by a quarter of a trillion. And of course, mechanic that means labor income would go up by one trillion and a quarter. So a pro-competitive policy in the US would not only increase GDP, but also redistribute from capital to uh, labor to the tune of 250 billion, which means that um, if you do the simulation across household, given that the median household, the median household in the US roughly has $50,000 of income per year, give or take, uh, but they don't earn much from dividends or share buyback. So they don't really pay this part. They get full benefit from this part. So in fact, uh, at the medium of the distribution, um, total disposable income goes up by almost 10%, even though private GDP goes up by roughly 5%, because roughly uh, private GDP is 20 trillion. So you add a trillion, it's like 5%. But for the household, for the median household, the net gain in uh, purchasing in standards of living is almost 10%. So it's very significant in terms of inequality as well. Um, it does not, uh, the one caveat though, it, it does very little for the very poor because the very poor, they, most of what they earn is government transfer and that's not directly linked to any of that. So they do gain a little bit, but it's not as massive. Um, so it's really, it would be like a good policy for the, the median household really. Okay, so that's kind of the, the big picture. Now there's much of the recent debate, of course, focuses on the superstar firms, so-called superstar firms. And today the superstar firms are all internet firms. So that's the one place where my comparison with Europe is um, kind of useless, not totally useless in the sense that the political economy is still very useful to understand the, you know, how they get away with it and lobbying so that you can still use Europe as a comparison. But in terms of economics, not much because Europe doesn't have Google. So therefore there's not much you can learn there. So what you can do though, is to look directly at these uh, star firms. And if you look directly at the star firms, you realize that the common wisdom is mostly wrong. Um, so the first thing is you would think given the, what you read that these firms are much larger than they used to be. Well, of course not, you have to define what you mean by large. So the, the natural way is uh, to, to look at um, total revenues or total sales divided by, well, technically you should divide by gross output because revenues is a gross output concept. But and in the paper with, with Herman, we have it uh, all ways you want, but it, whether you scale by gross output or GDP really doesn't change the picture. So just for simplicity, I'm scaling by uh, GDP. So this is sales over GDP. So the top one is the one that's sometimes reported, which is consolidated sales of US stars divided by US GDP. So now uh, the dominant firms you can define uh, in one of two ways. That's why you have the green um, and the red. The green is uh, just the top 20 firms, the, lar the, top, the largest 20 firms in the US. And you just ask this largest 20 firms in the US, 
if I add up all their revenues, how much of GDP is that? Okay. Of course, it's a large number. It's, you know, like uh, the revenues is something like 10 or 15% of GDP. So it's very huge. Okay. It's not like a small number. Um, and uh, the red line, which I like better because I think, first of all, there are more firms. So it's a bit more robust. And also you can avoid some of the composition effect instead of defining the, so the green is the top 20 firms, uh, either by market cap or, or by revenues. This figure is for revenues. You get the same if you use market cap. Um, but of course, the composition of industry might change over time. So if you're worried about that, you can use the red lines. The red lines use the top four firms in each industry. So the number of firms per industry remains constant. So that takes away some of the potentially mechanical issues of uh, industry classification. So let's look at this top line. So this is the total sales over US GDP of uh, the top uh, 20, top four firm by industry. So roughly that gives you about 100, 120 firms. So you can see there that, um, you know, from the from 1990 onward, this looks like there is an upward trend. Like these firms are becoming bigger relative to the economy. Well, the first thing to notice is that the, the, the biggest increase is, is before that, in the, is in the 60s and 70s. But the thing that's more important is that all of this growth here is abroad. None of it is in the US. So the mistake that people make is they, in a world where globalization is uh, becoming more and more important, they still divide consolidated global sales by US GDP. But that was okay in the 60s because in the 60s, it, actually, there was still a significant fraction of their sales that were going abroad. That's not the key difference. The key difference is the rest of the world was growing about the same speed as the US. Um, but in recent years, with China growing super fast, anybody selling in China is gonna have a higher share as a, compared to their own economy, okay? And in fact, if you neutralize that, that is now you look at, you can do two things, I'll show you both. This is domestic sales over US GDP. You can also do global sales over global GDP. Of course, but you cannot do domestic sales about global GDP, which is what people have done in the literature. So this line here, all it does is uh, it look at domestic sales over US GDP. For the first part, you see, it doesn't change anything. Like the, the big, the huge increase in the size of firms uh, from mid 60s to 1980 is there irrespective of the measure you're, you're using. Okay, so that's totally robust. That is the true expansion of big firms. Okay, um, but since then it's been completely flat. In fact, if anything, this is like lower than the 1980s. And definitely, if you look at the average here, you would you would not perceive any trend. And since 2000, definitely flat. Okay, another way of saying it is all of the growth here is coming from selling abroad. So Apple has half of its revenues abroad. So sure, if you sell scale by US GDP, it's going to look like it's growing, but it's all coming from China or Europe or you know replaced depending on where you sell. Okay, so that's, I think, is the very important. Now, you might wonder why is there a dashed line? Because obviously, if you want to estimate domestic versus uh, global sales, you need to have some information. And there's two ways you can do it. You can use uh, firm level information or you can use industry level information. Uh, the sources are different, but you can see that the trends are very similar. So it doesn't really matter how you uh, compute the domestic fraction of sales. Okay. In both cases, it's flat. Okay, so the first thing is the footprint of stars uh, is not really going up if you measure uh, if you measure it correctly. So this is for the US. The good thing with the US is we have great data, so we can go back in, in the past. You can do the same thing globally, but it's really hard to start anywhere before 1990. So now this is all the countries in the world, and this is GDP for the world. So same exercise though. So the green line is the largest 100 firms in the world. And I add up their revenues and I divide by uh, global GDP. That's the green line. And you can do the top 500, that's the orange line. Or you can neutralize industry effect by doing top 20 by industry, which in that case roughly gives you something like uh, 300 or 200 firms. And you can see that in both cases, there is a pickup in the 1990s. But since then, there is no evidence that the firms, the, the global dominant firms are growing faster than the global GDP. In fact, they are not. If anything, it's slightly falling towards the end. 
So that's completely inconsistent with any model where the dominant firm's productivity growth is higher than the average productivity growth in the world, because all of this would predict rising uh, sales over uh, global GDP. This is just saying that these guys seem to roughly grow at the same speed as the world economy. Okay, so that's the first thing that I think people missed. The second thing is, how strong is dividends for the winner take all effect? And I think uh, very weak is the answer. So um, this is looking at, so this is the US because the data is better in the paper we have global. So this is looking at, for each industry, let's look at the relative value of the top firm versus firm number two in that industry. And then uh, the orange one is the top firm versus the average of two, three, four, five. Okay, so take the green line. Roughly, it's like close to one half here in log points. That means that um, in the typical industry, the dominant firm, number one, is more than 50% more valuable than the next firm. Okay, this is based on market value of equity. So uh, that's a big gap, right? So that means that um, you know, the top firm is very significantly larger than the next one in terms of market value or net present value of profits. But there is no sense that this gap is growing. If anything, the highest is maybe in the 60s, but you know, who knows whether there's too few firms. If you look at this, you would say, well, it's around somewhere between 0.5 and 0.75 maybe, but it is not growing. So I don't think that you can conclude from there that there's more of a winner take all effect today than in the past. The truth is there always has been a winner take all effect. I don't think it's new. I don't think it's much stronger today. Um, the one caveat, which I'll come back to in five minutes, this is pre-COVID data. Post-COVID, something happens, but let's get to there in time. Okay, so uh, are they becoming bigger? Well, not really. Um, is, do we see more evidence of winner take all? Well, not really. Um, what about productivity growth? Okay, so productivity growth in the aggregate can happen in one of two ways. One is uh, within a firm, productivity goes up. That is for given inputs, capital and labor uh, in a given firm, output goes up. And so this is uh, usually called uh, the within or the Halton uh, contribution. So um, if uh, you start in a very tight economy where all margins are equalized, then that is the only source of growth because by definition, the marginal input is well allocated and therefore you don't gain by reshuffling inputs. Um, and if you, so if you, then you have the Halton theorem that says that if you start with all margin equalized, then productivity contribution of firm I is equal to revenues over, so that's the Halton fact that the weight is not equal to value added over GDP, but sales over GDP, which is more than one on average. Um, so the Halton contribution is the Halton weight, which is revenues over GDP times uh, internal productivity growth. And um, this is the estimation of the contribution to total US productivity growth coming from the within, in, the within firm, the Halton part of productivity growth. So um, this is by the top 100 or top four firm by industry. And you know they are very similar, so I, I, I discuss only one of them, so take the top four by industry. So this is saying that thanks to their uh, very good internal productivity growth, the top uh, 100 firms, so just 100 firms, added somewhere between 50 and 100 basis points of growth to the US economy year on year. So that's a big number. It's just 100 firms by themselves added, they moved up total US productivity by 50 to 100 basis points each year. So that's kind of amazing. The problem is this was true until the recent years, but since then it's dwindled to almost nothing. So the Halton contribution today is very close to zero, not like 50 to 100 basis points like it was in the past. So that's a big issue. That's part of the reason we don't have that much productivity growth anymore is because the top firms don't contribute as much as they used to. Okay, now you might ask, sure, but that, but Halton is not the only way because now if you 
course, in the real world, we know that the margins are not equalized. So if workers are more productive in a firm, in firm A than in firm B, if firm A hires workers away from firm B, then even if productivity in firm A doesn't change, aggregate TFP would go up, it's better allocation. And that margin is also quite important. So this margin is the red circle in this graph. We call it the reallocation margin. So this is again, you look at the top 100 uh, firms in the US and now you see their Halton contribution in green. That's the one from this line, it's the same exact one. Okay. And then this is their reallocation contribution. So this is if they, are, they happen to be more productive than the rest. So you, you need two conditions. They have to be more productive than the rest and they hire more than the rest, then they will contribute to productivity through the reallocation channel. And the answer is yes, they do in fact. Uh, and in, uh, it's particularly strong in the 1990s. So the 1990s is so spectacular because um, both the Hulton and the reallocation effect were very strong. So during the 1990s, our estimate is that the top 100 firms push the economy up by one and a half percent of productivity. So I was blown away when I saw that number, that just 100 firm, it's one and a half percent of US productivity. So it's huge. Uh, the Hilton, we already saw that it tends to dwindle after that. So today it's not that great. The contribution did pick up from reallocation. So in recent years, we did see a little bit of a revival of reallocation. Okay, so that's, uh, I guess my, I should have 2010 around here. So, you know, post uh, global financial crisis, we do see a bit of reallocation and it does help productivity growth. Okay. But if you add them up, so the total, uh, which is health and plus reallocation, it's still half of what it used to be. So the stars of today are not, uh, they, they are dominant, but they are not as uh, useful to uh, all of us as the stars of the past. Okay, so um, now the question I guess is, uh, let's be forward looking. So this graph, as you see, this top, I think the latest data we have is 2016, okay? So it's definitely uh, uh, pre-COVID. We shouldn't be able to do it to 2019 relatively soon, but post-COVID stuff has changed. So let's be a bit more forward looking and let's go back to theory a little bit. Okay, so the first is, um, you know, the dominance of the top firms. And um, one simple metric that I used in the past, I used in the book, in fact, is uh, the top five equity market share, because that's really simple to understand. Take all, to take the, all the publicly listed firms in the US, and in any given year, you rank them by market value, take the top five, divide the sum of their values by total market cap, okay? That's pretty straightforward. And that number is 10% and has been 10% since the mid seventies. The names change, of course. Uh, in the seventies, you have like uh, IBM is the dominant firms. If you do to the sixties, more like AT&T. Um, you have uh, firms like ExxonMobil. You have, uh, you know, soon enough, of course, in the nineties, Walmart uh, shows up, Microsoft. Um, so the names, of the, of the top firms change. But if you look broadly speaking, the top five firms account for roughly 10% of total market value. And that's been roughly relatively stable over time. But this is pre-COVID. So this is like uh, by groups of five years. So this 2015 corresponds to 2015 to 2019. And 2010, sorry, 2020 here at the end, this is just the, when I think I did it this summer. Okay, so that's the, the only data point post-COVID is here and it's close to 20%. So I, of course, I do not know whether it's gonna remain like that, but one clear impact of COVID was to create a situation where uh, in terms of market values, we, the top five firms are much, much more dominant than they have been in the past uh, 40 years, for sure. Okay. And it's not clear, it's not, it's not a big mystery, right? When COVID hit, Apple and Amazon were already doing great, and on top of it, this, they, they have a negative beta on COVID. So when the market tanked, they went up. So that's how you end up with uh, this extreme skewness. 
So that class is new, okay? Now, I don't know if it's gonna last. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing in and of itself, but this at least is a very new phenomenon in, in, in its uh, magnitude. Um, and uh, to finish up, I, I just want to highlight, um, you know, some useful stuff for future research. Um, so clearly, I think I've, I've tried to get the facts as correct as, as, as I can, um, but now going forward, we really want to think harder about uh, welfare. And um, I think the good news is um, that some of the tools are becoming more uh, available. So, you know, we used to have, you know, the choice between you could write a simple corner model or a bit of an extension of a corner model, um, or maybe like a simple game with, with two firms, two oligopolies. Uh, or you could go Bertrand, like we do in endogenous growth with like uh, ladder models, but then you restrict the ladders because otherwise it's not tractable. Or you have the new Keynesian with monopolistic competition. And nobody thinks that these are realistic descriptions. The world is a mixture of both. And recently, um, so there's this paper that I like, um, which um, managers, it's not perfect yet, of course, but they managed to have all of these in a tractable framework. This, you have a sense of corno strategic competition between top firms. You have a competitive fringe of firms that are small and compete almost, uh, almost like price takers. And uh, you have entry and exit and firms can become dominant or not. So that is kind of the framework we need to be able to talk about all of these dynamics. So that's kind of the first one. The second thing that was missing for a long time is dynamic mergers. Uh, the models of mergers that we have are very static. Again, I think it was mostly for tractability. Uh, but there is a recent paper that I find very interesting. Uh, it's the, it may be 2019, I forgot. It's the JP paper. And um, they have a dynamic merger model, truly dynamic. It is not exactly user-friendly yet. Like it's very complicated. But at least uh, it's a first pass, and that's definitely something we need to be able to talk about industry dynamics. Merger decisions are extremely dynamic, and their implications cannot be understood in a static game. But we didn't have the proper model to do it. So now we have. For big data, we also start beginning to have some models where we can you know, think about the granularity of data and how firms use it and whether it's going to skew the distribution or not. So that's useful. And the last one I want to talk about in conclusion is this nice paper that links uh, big data AI to the labor market, which I think is a very interesting finding. So the paper by Babina et al, um, they, I think they have a nice uh, insight, which is we don't know how to measure the capital part of AI very well. That is, we don't measure how much firms spend on intangible capital to build their artificial intelligence or big data machine learning systems. Because much of, um, because unlike say tools or machines, where most of the time, if a manufacturing company buys uh, machines or tools, it buys it from another company. You have, you have firms building machines and firms using machines. And in between, there's a market where they buy machines. The great thing in that case is you have a price and you have a quantity. The problem with a lot of the intangible investment is a lot of it is not purchased, but it's built internally. And therefore we have extremely bad data about how much firms are actually doing it. And Bavina and Al, their insight was, well, okay, that's true, but A, um, for uh, machine learning and AI, it requires a very specific set of skills to be able to do it. And B, we can measure the kind of workers these firms hire. So even though we cannot really measure directly how much they spend on the development internally of uh, their intangible capital, we can measure quite well the kind of jobs they try to fill. And so they, well, they, they go through job posting very uh, precisely and they show that uh, they can get a really good proxy for AI investment just by looking at the kind of worker that are, that are hired. So they look at job posting and they find the kind of jobs that will be used um, 
uh, to build AI system inside firms. And so they have like a labor market based measure of AI investment, which I think is super cool. Um, so that's the first thing, like in terms of measurement, that's huge progress. And the second thing that's very interesting is it makes you think about, um, you know, what are the factors that could keep dominant firms dominant? And when we think about barriers to entry, usually we think about, um, well, in the old ways we had like literally like physical cost of entry. Okay, so with the cloud and everything, that's just not, that's not such a big deal. Uh, then you have the Sutton approach, which I like a lot, which I think is extremely uh, useful, where Sutton argues, well, there are some um, costs that are gonna scale up, uh, with gonna be essentially proportional to output, so that the number of firms is gonna remain constant, even though the industry expands. And he thinks about advertising, perhaps R&D. And that, that I think we, we, we have some understanding of how it works. Um, and it's about brand building, okay? But I think today, another factor that's very important is gonna be the critical resource is gonna be human capital. So if uh, it is easier for um, dominant firms to attract the best engineers, that is going to become a critical source of barriers to entry for everybody else. Um, and I don't think it's the kind of barrier to entry that we uh, have thought about a lot in the past. And the data suggests that might be more important. So here you see um, the extent to which firms manage to, ha to hire uh, AI workers. That's a change in the share of AI workers in the firms between 2010 and 2018. And this is just whether they are located in a place where they can easily find AI workers. So the, that's the share of college workers in the commuting zone where the firms are located. Of course, this is just a correlation. But that's to me, it's very suggestive that we could have some polarization coming from the fact that um, access to critical human capital is gonna become a barrier to entry to some extent. Okay, so uh, these are to me uh, the, the most exciting development that I've seen uh, recently. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, can we maybe stop sharing? Thank you, Toma. So I'm going to start uh, sharing some questions that I've gotten and uh, to all attendees, the uh, Q&A is open for questions. Uh, uh, the chat is as well. Um, and you can also raise your hand and we'll see uh, time permitting if we can open mics. Uh, so here's a few, a uh, 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 couple of questions. I'll start with the ones that are uh, more uh, clarifying questions and then move to uh, other ones. Um, so one, one first question is about this good versus bad concentration uh, concept and how to operationalize it in terms of measurement. Uh, you showed some of the measures uh, based on markups, but of course markups are not that uh, easy to uh, measure. If you're model-based, uh, they can be directly related to concentration. Uh, so, so your advice on, on that is the first question. Um, so my advice on that would be uh, to spend a lot more time collecting prices. Because the one thing that I find shocking is that we have firm level data sets that are not linked to firm level prices. Um, and we use all kinds of excuses not to do it. Like, oh, these are multi-product firms or oh, it's complicated. I think it's a shame in 2020 that we don't have uh, good measures of prices at the, at the firm level. We have some industry deflators, of course, but um, I think that today, you, it would be uh, extremely useful if we had for each firm um, or each large firm, a set of vector of prices year by year for the products they sell. And not having it is a huge impediment to research. Uh, and the only reason it's like that is because of course, accounting data, which is the you know, underlying stuff in, in, in CompuStat, um, you report revenues, you, don't, you never report prices. You know why? Because firms hate to disclose the prices they charge, obviously. So that's kind of clear. Um, but I think the fact that we are still limited by that today is shameful. Um, in trade, they have better, the trade guys are more used to actually collecting prices. So I think there's hope there. Um, 
I used trade data in my uh, book because I wanted to get prices. The World Bank has some prices uh, in the, the when I showed you the, the price of telecom in France. But if you look behind what's there, it's also extremely disappointing um, because communication, for instance, the one I showed you, include uh, cell phone services, but a lot of other stuff, which have really very little to do with communication the way we think of it today. Um, and if you look at the World Bank data, for instance, like we pay millions of dollars for these guys to collect prices. They don't even have a price series for airplane tickets. Like, are you kidding me? Like we don't have, a, a, is there like the price of an airline ticket? How on earth is it not item number, maybe not one, but five on the list of stuff where it's not that hard that damage. You just take a Google site and then you just look for the, you scrap the data and you collect it. So the fact that we pay millions of dollars to these guys to collect data and they don't even have a time series for uh, airline ticket prices, I think is utterly shameful. So I think that's, by, that's the first order because Otherwise, if you ask me, do I believe revenue-based measure of markup? No, I think that the identification doesn't fly. I think the idea that you can be able to measure markup without having prices is just not going to happen. You have way too many assumptions you need to make to be, to be credible. So I think we need prices. That's, a, that's an answer that uh, will uh, sound, those with many people in the audience that I see are working with the price uh, data uh, for, for firms in Latin America, which seems to be better equipped for, for some of these questions. Um, I'll, I'll uh, move to a, a different set of questions, uh, more about the patterns that you showed. Uh, here's one uh, from the figures. Uh, it also seems that the impact of business cycle, particularly recessions on product growth has become larger or more evident in recent years. Is this apparent in the data? Could we think about the new structure being more sensitive to the cycle? Uh, well, the thing is, in, this, in recent years, we had the global financial crisis and now the COVID. So COVID, we don't have it yet. Uh, the, the GFC had a huge impact, but this, the thing is the drop in GDP was also quite large. And so um, if you adjust for that, like if you do um, not the naive measure of productivity, but like at least adjusting for utilization of capital, I don't know if that's become more cyclical. I think the... I don't think it has actually. Um, I think if you adjust properly for uh, cyclical effect or mismeasurement, like variable utilization, I think if anything, productivity has become slightly less pro cyclical today. I have no idea about COVID, of course, that I don't know how it's going to look. Um, so here's another question about the, the series that you showed. Why don't we see a, clear, a clearer China shock? I would have thought that uh, that would have led to more competition overall. Very good question. We do it, we do see it, it's in manufacturing mostly. So um, we, do see, we do see it in manufacturing. So for manufacturing, um, in the China shock is uh, large and visible. And um, it has a bunch of consequences that are quite interesting actually. Um, so the first one is there is a little bit, I mean, you know, if you write, think about the basic um, dynamic competition model, you have two forces that are, I mean, there's more than two, but there are two that are well identified and true in essentially every model we write. You have the expected rent effect and you have the escape competition effect. So the expected rent is saying like, if you, have, if you expect more profit in the future, you're gonna have tried harder to get these rents. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of model that can give you the fact that perhaps less competition leads to more innovation. The rents are bigger, you just try harder to get them. Um, the countervailing force is the escape competition effect, which is uh, if you don't have somebody uh, barking at your heels, you have less incentive to try hard. And with the China shock, we did see this second effect. So if you look at industries in the US that are heavily exposed to China, after the China shock, we see a shift towards more intangible investments. We see uh, like cost of goods sold becomes relatively less important and, and uh, you know, intangible investment or um, SGNA expenses become relatively more important. Um, so we do see that in the data. As an aside, by the way, that's another place where um, that makes it, that's, that's the first 
that's the reason I became suspicious of, of all measures of markup based on models revenue based, because at the end of the day, you know, you need to take a stand on what's the marginal cost. And if you look at the Deroker et al, it's like they use COGS. So if you use the Deroker model post China, it gives you the wrong sign. Why? Because in response to China, which is clearly more competition, some switch to SGNA. So the COGS, the COGS, COGS market goes up. You know, but that's just, this doesn't mean they have more market power. I just mean that they are fighting by, by trying to innovate their way out of the, the Chinese competition. Um, so, so that's kind of the main thing about China. You, you do see that. Now, the question quantitatively though is, you know, it is very important, but the US is still relatively close. So at the end of the day, if you look at, so it depends now how you think about welfare. I mean, the political economy of China, I think that's, it's huge. But if you look at, um, you know, just look at the uh, household expenditure survey or just look at where people spend money every, every month, a lot of it is domestic. Like people spend maybe two, 200 plus 300 bucks per month just on their cell phone and internet. You know, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of toys or a lot of plastic stuff. So before the manufacturing parts, um, you know, can catch up with that in terms of welfare, it's, it's a total order. So I think that uh, I, would, I would say that a good chunk of the welfare effect come from domestic industries that are not super heavily exposed to foreign competition. Um, the last thing about China, which is of course the great example with the washing machines, is that um, you know, there were a couple of mergers that were allowed, like, well, that, that, to be fair, it's not China, it's more like Korea and Japan. Um, it's like there was strong competition from Asian producers of uh, washer dryers. Uh, so then the domestic merger was approved um, based on the idea that there was strong competition from Korea and Japan, um, a merger that would not have been approved without foreign competition. The merger got approved and then immediately the merge entity, what do they do? They start lobbying like crazy for tariffs <laughs> and they got the tariffs which means then later that the consumer did pay higher prices uh, for their washing machines. So that's also, that the trade part is important there. So still on the, uh, on the patterns over time that you showed, how prevalent across narrowly defined industries is the increase in concentration in the US that you showed? I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty broad. I mean, uh, people have looked in details at uh, super, so what I find, so what's a little bit um, disconcerting is you can do, you know, like large scale stuff with, um, um, you know, SIC codes or NAICS code. And, but that even the most granular is not granular enough. And there's nothing in between. And then you jump directly to competition in the, in the uh, poultry processing in Michigan. Which is great, but you know, and then you don't have to have millions of paper because you can before you can get a, 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 an overview for the economy. So we, we, I would like something in between, which is more granular than ASIC code, but it doesn't require me to, you know, look at uh, every uh, industry, every state, you know, one by one before I get a sense of what's going on broadly. Uh, but people have done that, and um, I think, I mean, my sense is. Um, I think I would argue there's the big tech part, which is a big question mark. Um, then you have in the places where competition is still very good in the US, there's a wholesale and retail trade, no question. And everything else doesn't look that great. Like, so beer, of course, I mean, there's companies that are super like the beer, uh, beer industry that's become way more concentrated. The, uh, if you look at poultry or, or food processing, it's way more concentrated. Um, I think the, the retail is, um, is maybe the, the main uh, opposite uh, result. Also in retail though, the, the, you have the issue of the geography. So you need to define the market. Uh, that's what uh, Esteban Rosianberg and his quotas, which is they argue well in some cases, you know, like if you have a national chain expanding, uh, you could measure more concentration nationally, but in fact, there's lower concentration locally. And that in retail trade, it happens. Okay, so still in this uh, chapter, where did I, okay, so, um, so you should, 
yeah, here. You show there's no concentration in weight uh, of top firms, but also the concentration measures overall have increased, uh, I guess this is, uh, in the US. Uh, there's also the evidence that markups uh, increase. You have also uh, posed some questions about those measures of markups. Uh, but in the end, the question is how do we square? Yeah, so there is a, there is an issue. It, I think it's not totally squared. So uh, I can tell you what I do know. Uh, I know for sure that um, for very large firms, it is critical to distinguish foreign and domestic sales because the very large firms are also on average, the more globalized. So I think that uh, the um, whether the top firms have become domestically more important or not, that's an open question, at least not in the simple measure. Okay, so I think that's the step one. Now concentration is not just the top firm, it's like say the top five or top eight. Um, so, uh, that's where the, most of the measures are, and that's where we see a rise in concentration to some extent. Um, and I think that there, even if we do it properly by looking at domestic shipments as opposed to uh, global consolidated shipment, we still see some concentration. So I think that's where. Now, wh what happens between the top one, two firms versus you know, uh, the top 10, uh, that is something I don't fully understand. Um, for markups, um, the well markups there is also another big thing we haven't mentioned which is taxes so the question is are profit so we know profit margin in the us are high today are they high historically depends a little bit so the profit margins today pre-tax so price divided by some measure of cost um, they are high but they are not higher than what we saw in the 1960s like the pre-tax profit margin of Facebook is very similar today to the pre-tax profit margin of AT&T in 1960, roughly speaking. Now, the post-tax is way higher today. So if you look at pre-tax profit margins, they are higher today than say 20 years ago, but they are not a lot higher than they were in the 60s. If you look at after-tax margin, they are higher than 20 years ago and higher than in the 60s because the effective profit tax at that point was almost 50%. So at and had huge profit margin, but literally paid half of it in taxes. While today it's more like 20%. And that's important because that explains the valuation effect. So there is no question that firms, to the, the dominant firms today have higher after tax profit and valuation than some of the ones in the past. That is for sure. Um, as a, their value relative to the economy, relative to GP is higher. Um, and a lot of, a good chunk of it is also lower taxes. So let me now move to other types of questions. Uh, this one says, this is more of a political economy question, but how do you explain the differences in the uh, regulatory policy between Europe and the US? Um, so there are two, uh... I guess two stories or two um, interpretations. One is more pessimistic and one is a bit more optimistic. So the pessimistic is the one that uh, Luigi Zingales would uh, push. And he says, it's just because we started after. So you can have a kind of, you know, you can say, well, the US started to deregulate, take the telecom industry. So there was a telecom bill in the mid nineties. And you could argue they were trying to do the right thing and maybe it was a bit successful, but eventually the telecom firms managed to find a way to game the system and get back all of the market power they had plus more. And then in, in that view, when France did its deregulation in 2011, uh, it, was, it is still very successful, but in a few years, they're gonna find a way to reconstruct their oligopoly. So then in that case, the fact that Europe seems to do better in, anti, in market regulation, broadly speaking, antitrust being a small part of it, um, in recent years, just the fact that it's, purely like a timing effect and just we started after. So that's kind of one view. Um, I have a more optimistic view, which is, I think that when we build the EU uh, for uh, political reasons, we, and, um, we build a system of checks and balances, which is very different from what we used to have at the country level. And uh, in fact, that's, I have a, a paper that shows that um, the same countries that would not favor free competition at home 
would favor free competition at the EU level. And the main reason is at the EU level, if somebody managed to capture the rents, either by capturing the regulators or the politicians or both, you don't know who's gonna get it. So if at home, you know, because if you're a domestic politician, that's for you. But if you're an EU, if I at the EU level and you're German, you're thinking, whoa, maybe the French are gonna manage to capture the commission. The and the French thinks, oh, maybe the Germans are gonna be able to capture the, the, the commission. And then um, the smaller members are worried that the French and the Germans are gonna team up together and impose policies that would be detrimental to the smaller countries. And so all of that conspire to create a Nash equilibrium where everybody chooses to set up very independent, fiercely independent market regulators at the EU level, sort of as a commitment that nobody will be able to influence them. And it's safer for everyone to do that. Of course, they understand the cost, which is they will not be able to influence the commission when they would like to, but it's a smaller cost compared to the threat that somebody else would gang up against them. So that's my interpretation of the EU. And I think it's enshrined in the treaties so then it boils down to how hard would it be to change the treaties? My experience of working in Europe uh, as a policymaker or advising policymakers is it's very, very hard to change the treaties. And so I think that uh, this is gonna be persistent. So I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic than Luigi on that one. So I, I now realize I should have put the following question in the previous packet, but, but let me then go back to uh, uh, trends over time. Uh, do you know about concentration in the developing world after trade liberalizations and market reforms in the United by contrast to uh, these European and US patterns? It's a very good question. And the, answer is, the short answer is no, actually. I mean, I, I read a couple of case studies um, I, uh, I know that uh, I've, I've seen some data from um, developing Asia. I've seen some data from Japan, some data from various countries in Asia, but nothing systematic. So, I, but I think it's um, very important. And also, also would be super useful as a benchmark because these are countries, at least some of them that are relatively open. So you have foreign competition plays a relatively larger role probably, and it might help the identification. Um, and, but I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen direct evidence, not that I can think of at least. Let me now um, put one of my, my own. So I've been wondering, uh, we're, we're here thinking about concentration and, and potential damage of uh, this bad market power for say uh, growth and, and, and welfare. And, and, but I'm trying to think more generally from the perspective of development. And so perhaps back to this uh, last question as well. Um, I, th I see that one of the big issues that we see in terms of development and firms is the uh, opposite of concentration, this huge prevalence of uh, tiny firms uh, that capture uh, a very large chunk of the productive factors. And in fact, given their uh, huge numbers, they also capture a good part of the, of the market share in, in almost every industry, especially in services industries in, in this uh, more uh, developing countries. Uh, so uh, have you had a chance to uh, give a thought about concentration and development in the other end of the distribution of uh, firms, it, it looks as though one of these uh, good uh, good ends of concentration is uh, the move towards concentration in, in these countries where, where there's such huge fragmentation. Yeah, I think that would be like, um, um, I think that, that's, that literature body would connect more closely to the misallocation literature. Um, so CA, Clino and, and followers where, um, but I think you can still think of it in the, in the same framework, which is take a market equilibrium with um, local firms and search costs or transport costs, lower the costs or either search or transport. And what you get is consolidation because firms that 
could survive despite being relatively inefficient just because they were super close to the consumers, either in terms of information or in terms of uh, physical distance. Uh, suddenly, if the market, if it's easier for consumer to shop further away, then these guys are gonna disappear and uh, uh, only the more productive are gonna survive and you're gonna have massive reallocation and you're gonna have TFP growth through reallocation. So I think that you, it's, it seems to be plausible to argue that um, in, um, in many of these markets, you would have room for uh, efficient concentration if it's driven by uh, lower search costs. But so, but to me, like, I think at the, having looked at the data and thought about a little bit the equilibrium in the political economy, in my mind, I think the, it's still the, probably the most important is um, the free entry, like making sure the market remains contestable. My sense is if you make sure the market remains contestable, you can't go very wrong. Like you may not get the first best, but as long as markets are contestable, that some entry can happen and a little bit does happen in equilibrium, I think you're pretty safe. Um, and then, um, so I would be like, if I had to guide policy, I would be like, the thing I would be really focused on is that, is there a little bit of entry uh, everywhere? Um, it doesn't have to be a lot because in equilibrium, it might not happen, um, but, uh, the thing that gets me worried is when I see the same players over and over, and it looks like they don't face any uh, threat of entry. Uh, and then once you have that framework, um, you may see higher or lower concentration depending on what's changing in the economy, but I don't think you can mess it up too badly. So I, that would be like the, the way I think about it. Um, the other thing is, uh, I mean, there is a sense in which competition is, is at, as a bit of a public good effect. Um, in fact, in you know some standard models, uh, you know, uh, firms have a high, like individual firms have a higher incentive to defend their rents because it's like concentrated. Well, the benefits of lower prices would be more diffuse. So uh, models of uh, lobbying would predict why rents would, would persist just from free riding issues. Um, I think that's true for this. I think it's true more broadly where uh, infrastructure that makes it easier for people to compare prices or uh, makes it easier to, for people to shop around, these have positive effects. These have um, almost like, definitely they show up as externalities uh, if, the, if there is other constraint in the economy. And so the policymakers, I mean, in my mind, they should be working very hard on trying to make sure that of expanding the choices, the choice set of consumers and decreasing um, switching costs. Like, I think um, one way to think about it, to think about the cell phone market, you know, uh, like one big convenience we have is if we switch provider, we can keep the same number. This was not, of course, an industry equilibrium. The industry equilibrium was the opposite. This was imposed by regulators. So to me, this is the typical kind of good regulation that we can have. You don't tell people what to do. You don't tell firms what to do. You just force them to say, well, anybody who wants to switch uh, should be able to keep their number. That created competition in the market for uh, cell phones. And I think that was very useful. Um, now, in, the, in theory, of course, um, you could have switching costs being too low for the same reason competition can be too high and decrease innovation. Okay, but that's where I think political economy is very first order, which is, I don't believe that happens in the real world. I believe switching costs are too high because the firms always manage to get them higher than they should be. So we don't start from the optimal where switching costs are optimal and where maybe decreasing them could hurt innovation. Um, I think we start far away from this because of political power that firms can use to keep the switching costs high. So to me, again, like contestable market and um, increasing the choice of consumers and lowering switching costs, I, don't know, I, I would say that it's very hard for me to imagine a world in which that doesn't improve welfare. So uh, I'm out of this question. So I just wanted to follow up uh, very shortly on this last answer. Yes, I, I have an easy time imagining switching costs and, and measures to reduce switching costs in, in uh, many services. Uh, 
Is, is there an analogy in uh, manufacturing that you have in mind? And then with that, um, I think we have the the, the question list uh, checked. Good. Um, so manufacturing, I mean, my uh, sense is um, for, for most countries in the world, um, if they remain reasonably open to foreign trade, they will have enough competition in manufacturing. It's not a huge share of, of the economy for most countries. A, a very significant fraction of manufacturing is, you know, tradable goods. So um, I think that in manufacturing, it is really not that hard to imagine that foreign competition would do the job. And as long as you keep the enough, you know, it doesn't have to be maybe perfectly free open, but as long as it's, there's enough openness to foreign trade, I think that should, that should keep the local monopolies in check. Um, it's really the, the sectors where in transport, energy, um, healthcare, um, and uh, trade, retail, professional services, that I think that's where I am more, much more worried. You know, like manufacturing goods are so easy to ship, but professional services, whether scientific or legal services, like some of these guys are really good at protecting their rents. You know, lawyers are very good at that, for instance. So legal services are way too expensive on average. Um, and it's very hard to compete. I mean, you can hire, if you're super rich and your documents are in English and uh, you have, uh, and, and even some of them are written under British or New York law, sure, you can hire uh, outside uh, lawyers to help you with your deal. But that's going to be a very small fraction of, of, of firms. All the other ones have to deal with local uh, say legal services. And these guys are very much not subject to foreign competition. So that's what I would worry about. Well, with that, Thomas, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this thank has you been very a much. fascinating presentation. And thanks for your willingness to answer all of these questions. Um, I've enjoyed this uh, session a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people have as well. We've had uh, close to 60 people for most of the presentation and, uh, and now are uh, about uh, 40. So thank you very much. It was great uh, having you. Uh, we're all hoping to be able to meet in person again at some point, uh, hopefully not too far in the future. But in the meantime, this has been a, a great way to keep the, uh, the possibility to meeting in some way alive. Thank you Thank so you. much. Uh, Have a great day. Goodbye. Have a great bye -bye. day.